Good evening. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Tavorim. We finally bring together all of the shuls of the world. Uh, on Parsha's Tavorim, there's no split anymore of Eretz Israel and Chutz Lords, what they're laning and what they're not laning. Um, I did receive a few messages about the noise of the air conditioning and we're working on a solution. It's not here yet, my apologies. If <clears throat> the sound of the air conditioning, it is a little bit hot outside, so it's very difficult to give this year without any air conditioning, but hopefully in the next week or two there will be some solution to have it, but have it without all of the noise that comes along with it. Parsha's Devarim, as we usher in the final Chumash, uh, which begins before Tisha B'Av, Parsha's Devarim is always the Shabbos before Tisha B'Av. And even though this Shabbos is Tisha B'Av, but it becomes a Nidcha. That means Asara B'Teves, if it were to fall out Shabbos, we would fast Shabbos, because it says Be'etzem Hayom Hazed, the same Lashon as Yom Kippur. But Tisha does not have that status in terms of severity and as a fast. It, of course, is the second most important fast day that we have. Uh, and it's a 24 and a half hour fast and it brings along with it other chumras, other inyanim, which the Shulchan Aruch says we can't wash, we can't eat, uh, we can't uh, wear regular shoes. And the regular shoes that we don't wear on Tisha B'av is because of pure mourning. Like if someone lo aleinu lo aleichem is sitting shiva, so he takes off his shoes because that is one of the halachas in regard to mourning. Yom Kippur, as I've mentioned to you, has nothing to do with mourning. It's a yom tif. We take off our shoes as a kapara for the 20 silver coins that they sold their brother Yosef and they bought shoes with those 20 silver coins and that's why we do not wear shoes on Yom Kippur as a kapara for those shoes that were purchased with the kidnap money. Um, but Tishvav is pure availus. Now the fact that it is a Nidcha, it is pushed off from Shabbos into Sunday, it brings it down a notch in terms of severity. Uh, I've mentioned to you that if a person is a Sandik Amoyal or the father of the baby, then when it's a Nidcha, they're allowed to eat. And the Vilna Gon in Shari Tzion is brought down, the Vilna Gon who says that if it's not even a nidcha, but it's a regular Tisha B'av, and someone is the father of the baby or a sandik, he can eat. But that's like really a das yachid in the world is not so much noyig like that. Maybe those who are noyig purely every minig hagro, they would eat on a regular Tisha B'av. But we certainly, L'chol Adeus, could eat. Uh, only the Balatanya says that if you end up eating, you have to make up the fast day a different day in the year. You have to make it up, but no one else holds that. They all hold that it's yumptive for the person, and he is allowed to eat, he's allowed to wear shoes, he's allowed to do whatever. I wouldn't wear shoes if I was a sandik because I feel, I mean, at the bris I would, but I wouldn't wear it outside because of Mara Sain. People would think that we're walking in leather shoes on, on Tishba Chasr Sholem. So just for that, I wouldn't do it. But really, it's a halacha of pure yomtev if the person's allowed to go eat lechatchila. Uh, anyway, 
coming back to either the Shabbos before Tisha B'Av or the Shabbos like this year of Tisha B'Av, we lay in Devarim. Sefer Devarim, Moshe Rabbeinu began to say on Rosh Chodesh Shvat. And he said it for 36 days. The 36 days began Rosh Chodesh Shvat and went and told the sixth day of Odar and Zion Odar, he was Nifter. And indeed the the Orachayim HaKadosh asks, why is the word Ela the first word of the Sefer? Because we could have began the Pusik by just simply saying, Hadvarim Asher Diber Moshe El Kol Yisrael. We didn't need the word Ela, but the Orachayim HaKadosh says that since there were 36 days of saying the Sefer Devarim by Moshe Rabbeinu, the word Ela is Begematria numerically 36. Ela, and Aleph is one, the Laman is 30, and the A is five. That's 36. And other Mephorshim continue and say that the reason the Torah, I mean, that's what the Arachayim HaKadosh is, a remiss to the 36 days, that he took the opportunity of chastising and rebuking Klal Yisrael, because that's what the Sefer really is very full of, um, a rebuke. And he wanted to seize the opportunity before he was nifter to say to Klal Yisrael what was on his mind. He felt they were going to have a very long jury journey through Golos and through the four Golos, and, and they were in for a lot until the Geula Shlema would come. And they needed to set their mind into a serious format to be able to survive as Yidn. Now, it says, the Medrash talks a lot about it, and the word Eicha is also the gematria of 36, Aleph Yud Chof A, which is 36. And the many Meforshim, and uh, many of the Kadmoinim talk about the 36 Chiyuve chorus. And it says in Medrash that with everything we say that the first base of Mikdash was destroyed because of the Gilu Yaroyos and the Shvichas Domim and the, the Avodazora and the second base of Mikdash was because of the Sinas Chinam <coughs> that there was a lack of due respect to each other, and there was a conjured up hatred between Yid to Yid, and that's why there was no base of Megiddo. But the Medrash says with all of that, they never would have been sent into Golos and had the Chorban base on Mikdash ever if not for the fact that they were over on the 36th Chiyuve Chorus. And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu, these Mephorshim, they spoke for 36 days because he wanted to remind them that when they would fall into Chiyuve Chorus, that that would be the propelling reason for all of the destruction and all of the difficulty that we have lived through the 2,000 years since the second base of Migdash was destroyed, um, and to be able to come to this point, uh, hopefully we're very close to Mashiach and to the Geula, but if you think back for a moment, what Yidin have lived through, it's a miracle that we're still around, and it's a miracle that we're still faithful 
to our Kodesh Baruch Hu and that Yiddishkeit is thriving, not just surviving, but thriving with the Limud Torah and the Chesed that is done worldwide after we were so condemned and, and suffered such expulsions and such pogroms and crusades. Um, and I once said that in a debate when they said to me that our religion, the Christian religion, Lahavdil, we are a religion of compassion and love and pity. And you, Rabbi, your religion only talks about uh, that there is revenge taken, alavos uh, and on generations, that it's a revengeful religion. And I answered him and said that if you will think back or look back for a moment in history, never was a non-Jew, whoever he was, Christian, Muslim, whatever he was, was ever killed because he did not become a Jew. We never ever killed anyone <clears throat> trying to get them to cross over. The opposite, if somebody wanted to become a Jew, we discouraged them. If you were born into a different religion, just keep the seven, don't kill, don't steal, don't do these things, and then you're a fine non-Jew. And if God wanted you to be born into the religion, uh, he would have had you born to Jewish parents. So just being, that's our answer to anyone who comes to convert. We, of course, do take converts if there's sincerity. And the uh, result says that if somebody in a very serious, honest, conversion becomes a Jew, it's a sign that he was once a Jew. And he drifted, like at the time of Spain, where so many thousands wanted to save their lives, and we can't judge them. We can't say to them, well, I'll be aloha, you shouldn't have gone into the church, you should have given your life. For us to say it, it's very easy to say. But for somebody who was there with a wife, with children, with parents, to just pass that judgment, we're out of order. We cannot judge them. And many of them didn't stand up to the moment, and they did go into the church and be baptized and did whatever they thought that they had to do to be able to survive. But the Arizal says that when someone comes today and wants to sincerely become a Yid, not because of someone's money and not because of wanting to marry somebody, and that's the whole motivation. So if it's pure, that's a sign that they were once Jewish and they're just coming back to their roots. But I began saying that a person who became a Yid and truly wants the Yiddishkeit, he is able to enjoy Yiddishkeit like any other Yid. It says 15 times in the Torah that you have to be careful how you treat a Ger. We're never allowed to say to Ger, well, look, you're, look at your roots. You come from Goya. Not allowed to say that to a... To. So the point being that I would say that never was a non-Jew killed because he didn't become a Jew. But look, you're talking about the religion of compassion and love and mercy. Look at the Crusades, how many hundreds of thousands of people were slaughtered in the rivers of blood because they refused to convert. 
Do you call that a religion of love? A religion of pity? A religion of compassion? Uh, and that's what I answered them. In any event, Moshe Rabbeinu knew that these 36 Kayuve chorus would doom Klal Yisrael. So the very first word that he said in this week's Sedra of Devarim was Ela Hadvarim. That because of all of those 36 problems of Yidin to be able to hold themselves back from crossing over the line caused the forbidden even though there was chinas, sinas chinam, and there was the three cardinal sins that were desecrated and ignored. Now, the, this Shabbos, when we lane the Haftorah, we lane a Haftorah from Yeshayahu, and it begins Chazon Yeshayahu. And indeed, many people refer to the Shabbos as Shabbos Chazon, because of that first word that is in the Haftorah. The Bnei Yisoster says a very important and interesting statement on that, and that is that in the generation of the prophets of the Nevi'im, every generation had a Navi, the prophet, but there was also a Choyza, a visionary. Now, a visionary never was at the Madrega, the level of a Navi. Never. It was MS, and they were communicated with by a Kurdish but it did not have the severity or the backbone of Navua. What was one major difference between the prophet and the Choyze? was that whatever the Choyzes saw and said did not have to happen. The Navi, anything that Yechezkel or Yeshaya, any one of them, what they said once they saw it, and they said it, they repeated to the people that Ko Amar Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says such and such, it had to happen. So the question asks the Bnei Sussler, Yeshaya was a Navi. Why did he say it in the category under the umbrella of Choyza? Chazon, Yeshaya. Yeshaya didn't say Chazon, he said Nevoah. Because Yeshaya made this exception, because he didn't, what does he talk about in the Avtar? The destruction, the orbit. And he didn't want to have to have it happen. He didn't want, and if he said it as the Nevoah that he saw, and he repeated it as such, it would have had to happen to Corbin. So he wanted to say it to Klal Yisrael under the umbrella of Choyze, so it didn't have to happen. And this is the only place that we find in all of the Nevoahs and the entire Sefer of Yeshayo, that it, he said over something to Klai Yisrael under the category of Choyza, and that's why our Haftorah begins with Chazon Yeshayo. Even though he saw it at the level of Nevoah, but he gave it over to Klai Yisrael only under the category of Choyza, so it shouldn't have to happen. So says the Bnei Yisosko. Now we know at the very beginning of the Sedra that Moshe Rabbeinu 
referred to different things that Klal Yisrael did in his chastising them in a remez. Rashi says right at the beginning of our sedra, his kiran beremez. He mentioned that Nert, he didn't say you rebelled by Korach. He said vachatzeros because the place where they were rebelled was called chatzeros. So he only talked about it as chatzeros. He didn't come out and say that you were terrible, rebellious, and what you did, and look what happened to Klai Yisrael, 250 people died. He just said Chatzeros, a reference to the place. And Rashi points out, why did he do this? He did it with Nekvodon Shel Yisrael, because of the honor of Klai Yisrael not to openly rebuke and to, in their face, start off the Sefer Devarman. As a matter of fact, if you look into the Sif Seichachomim, the Sif Seichachomim says that we learn from this, that a person should never begin, even if he has a valid criticism. It could be with his child. Child walks through the door after a day in yeshiva, having to sit at a desk for six hours, eight hours, 10 hours, and he comes in hungry and, and tired. and Don't, when he walks through the door, say the first thing, why didn't you make your bed today? Why didn't you? Don't start off with any of the criticisms. If he didn't make the bed, you want to talk about it? No problem. Let him catch his breath. Let him eat. Let him relax a little. And then you, in a loving way, could bring it up. But this is Sifsei Chachamim. And a husband with a wife, or a wife with a husband, there can be a valid point that they want to bring up. But never at the very beginning, like the husband comes home from work, or the wife got done just doing a ton of laundry and she's sitting down to have a tea. Not to start off a conversation or a get together in a negative way, and that goes for Rabbanim and it goes for communal leaders and for teachers in a classroom. And that's why the Gemara said that Rava, when he began his shear, he began with a joke. He always found something, the Gemara says, to say that made the Talmudim laugh. Because when a person laughs, for one minute, doesn't have to be a half an hour, for the one minute statement, it relaxes his mind, it relaxes his composure, his whole, everything about him. It's a different thing, because he could have come in to the shear that he was on a block, that there was some madman honking his horn all the way up the block, and by the time this guy got out of his car, he was ready to jump through the window of the other guy because he made him so nervous. Uh, and so so he always opened the Gemara, says, with a joke. And it worked very well because it created a very positive atmosphere in the classroom. This is Rava the Amora. So... <clears throat> The Sifsei Chachamim says the same thing, that beginnings you have to work at to create good atmosphere. Because there's an obvious kasha. If Rashi says that he only referenced the places by the names of the places, the next thing he said was Vidi Zohav, which is a remez <coughs> to the ego. These of a lot of gold that they made, but he didn't say the word ego or anything. So we see that everything was with the remez. But when we go to the next centers, like an Akiv Hashem Hisanaf B, he openly says that you made the ego Masechad. 
So if Rashi is saying that he wanted to protect the honor of Kleisrael, so over here he did it this way. But over there, why did he openly put it in their face? Which is exactly what he's saying he didn't want to do over here. And why did he do it there? So, Mephorshim say that, and as a matter of fact, it's the Medrash, that after he got done in the beginning of the center of Devarim, reminding them of the places where they did these terrible things, they did tshuva me'ahava. Klal Yisrael did tshuva me'ahava. Now we have a rule that if someone does tshuva out of fear, he's afraid he's going to be punished, he's afraid he's not going to have a good year, and he does tshuva out of fear, so all of the Averis he did, even if they were bemazed, whatever he did, all of those Averis become shogeg, unintentional. In other words, they are moved up a notch. They are moved up a step from being a blatant, mazed, intentional Avera they now become unintentional. And that's Yom Kippur. And that was what Moshe Rabbeinu asked for an extra day, not just about Shavuos, an extra day of preparation, but an extra day <coughs> of having sukkahs before Hashem sent off the piskin because he didn't want it from fasting and from crying of Yom Kippur, which only made the Averis up to the level of Yira. But out of Simcha and Ava, they became Zochiosh. They became mitzvahs. So, and that's the reason that Rebarak Mejabush says that we go for Mayim Shalon and we go back to the water after circus to take out the water and bake our matzahs with them. If we threw in tons of Averis and Rosh Hashanah, what are we going back to that same water? and putting the Averis into our matzahs. But the answer is we did tshuva me'ava, call yourself. So now sitting in the lake or river are tons of mitzvahs because they were transformed into zochios, to mitzvahs, and we now take those mitzvahs and put them into our matzah. Because you know that when we bake matzah, hand shmur matzah, you take mayim shalonu, there's water from a lake or from a river that we put into the matzah in the baking process. And it's those that water with those mitzvahs that are now incorporated into our matzah. So the Mephorshim say that true, the first sedra, our sedra of the Shabbos, that he rebuked them and chastised them and he did it with great caution and great softness by only mentioning the name of the city. But in two centers, after they started doing tshuva me'ava, we had no problem saying openly the Avera because now they were mitzvahs. They were proud of it because we took those terrible, terrible Averas and we elevated it into beautiful mitzvahs. And around four months ago or five months ago, I said to you something which is really a very, when I repeat it at a Malava Malka for an audience or for whatever, it always gets a tremendous reaction and I will take the opportunity now with your permission uh, to just quickly say over the Misa because it is such a thundering message to each and every one of us that when Reb Mendele of Riminev was nifter on Lamed Dalet Omer, the day after Lagba Omer, he came to Shemayim and it says that he, and there were many Talmidim who had Ruach HaKodesh who all said the same thing. He started going from Gehenim to Gehenim to Gehenim and emptying it out and getting the people put into Ganeim. And when he came to the Heichel, the Gehenim, 
of echte v'oshev, that a person who says, well, I'll do the affair and look, Yom Kippur comes, I'll cry, I'll fast, I'll do tshuva. So the Gemara says that if someone says echte v'oshev, that I'm doing the Avera now, but I have in mind I'm going to eventually do tshuva. Ein maspikim biyodo lasos tshuva. There's no question that he is not given an opportunity to do tshuva. In other words, he cannot do tshuva for the Gemara says. So when Reb Mendel and Ribbon have got done emptying out the Gehenna's, and he came into the Gehenim of the Echte V'oshev group. So the Malik said, you can't take them. The Gemara says, ain't must speak in Biodo. So he answered and said, I always learned that Gemara to mean, ain't must speak in Biodo. Ain't must speak in. There's no question. Sheyesh Biodo Lasos Shuva, that he will have the opportunity. So the Malach said to him, it's a beautiful drosha, but this is Shemayim, and we don't make droshas in Shemayim. At that moment, the Choyzeh was still alive, the Choyzeh of Lublin, and he was at Shalosh Shudas here in this world, because Reb Mendel was nifter on Lamed Dalet Ba'omer, between Pesach and Shavuot. But the Choyzeh was nifter that year on Tishavu. The Choyza of Lublin's yard site is Tishabov. So he was still here in Olam Hazem, and he was sitting at his Tish at Shalashudas, and no one realized that he was sitting there looking at this scene in Shemayim of Reb Mendele and the Malach. So he realized that Reb Mendele couldn't take the people out because he was using a, a new drush, and you don't make new drushes in Shemayim. Uh, and the Choyza gave a clap on the table, and he said, Rabosai, and the people didn't know what was going on and why he was saying this. But he said that the Gemara says that Efta Vyoshev ain't maspikim, that he has never given the opportunity. And I learned the Gemara here in Oilum Hazer, that ain't not speaking, there's no suffix, she yesh biyodo lasos tshuva, that he is given an opportunity, and at that moment the Malach stood aside and let Reb Mendele take everybody out of that Gehenim and brought back into do tshuva, uh, into the, the realm of Gan Eden. Now, the with that, they answer a kasha. In other words, all the Averis that he was talking about in Dvarim were put into a different category of mitzvahs, and that's why in all the subsequent sedras, he was able to openly refer to them, and it was not affecting Kavod and Shal Yisrael, like Rachi says here, because they were now mitzvahs. Now, there is a famous question Yishmael, at the end of his life, did tshuva. And we learned this, the Medrash says, and the Chazal Rashi brings it, <coughs> that, when, that when Avram Avinu was nifter, that Yishmael let <coughs> Yitzchak walk before him at the burial of Avram. And why did he let him walk before? Because he realized he was at Tzadik Gomer, and he himself was, but Yishmael lived a very bad life. In other words, there was terrible things that he did. So the Chazal say that he did tshuva, and Rashi brings it, at the end of his life. And that's why he let Avram, uh, Yitzvah go before him. And since he did tshuva, now they all became mitzvahs. And that's why it says, because Rashi there brings, that since he did tshuva, kulam shavin latoiva. Like it says by Sora Imenu, that it says that meyer shana v'esrim shana, meyer shana v'esrim shana v'sheva shanim, and it says shana shana shana, 
to tell you kulon shov shovim letoiva that they were all considered equally good. That when she was 110, she was at the top of the world in terms of tzidkis, and when she was seven, this, all her years. And the same Lashon is said by Yishmael. So they ask and say, how could you say that all of his years were good? He did such a virus and everything. So the answer the Chazal say is our same answer that he did Shufa Me'ava. So they all became Zachia. So all those years of Avera became mitzvahs with a shining luster and a glow of Simcha. And that's why Rashi could say, Kulam Shavin Latoifa by Yishmael. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu at the very beginning of the Sedra says that Be'ever Ayardain Be'eretz Moab Ho'el Moshe Ba'eretz HaTorah Hazos. Moshe Rabbeinu began this speech, the last 36 days of his life. He began uh, and he did it Be'eretz Moab. Now, Moab, we are very critical of. We say that we can't marry into Moab. Even Mitzrayim, who beat us and killed us and threw our children into the water, but in their DNA, they still have, they were doing it because they were ordered to do it. It wasn't something they themselves wanted to do. And after three generations, you can marry into a Mitzrayim. But by Moab, Amon and Moab, forever, we're never allowed to marry them. Because in their DNA, they're rotten to the core. If someone could say, let us have some water, and we will pay you full price. We're not asking you for anything free or anything. And to deny them and went out to war and went out to fight them, don't you drink a drop of our water. That show that their, their DNA and essence was rotten. And someone who has such rotten meat does we don't want in Claude Israel. So the question asked, why is it the Shach Torah, not the Shach from Shulchan Aruch, he lived like 150 years before that Shach. I lived like 500 years ago. Um, he asks, why would Moshe Rabbeinu begin to go over the Torah in Moab? In a place in Moab. Moab. Why would he do it in Moab if it's such a rotten place? So the answer is because Rus. Rus was to come out from Moab. There was a darsh, there was a drosha that only the men, in other words, Amon and Moavi, but Amon Velo Amonis, that the Isra is on Amon, but not Amonis, not the Goy, not the lady. And Moab, Velo Moavis. And that's how they were able to be machshir Rus, because we know that the reason that Yirmiyo wrote the whole story of Rus, wrote the Sefer of Rus, which is part of our Chavdalit Kisve Goydesh, was because he wanted to be Machshir, because they, the head of the Sanhedrin didn't want to allow David Amelot to become king. He said, what are you talking about? He's not even Jew king. He's not even Jewish. So Yermio sat down and wrote Rus to show that there was this was the story, and he, she ended up marrying Boaz, and they paskin then that it's Am Moav Moavis, and he's a hundred percent kosher Yid, and to become king, and then they made him king. But that was the reason that Yermio wrote the Sefer of Rus to be Machshir Dovid Amela. 
So the whole reason, says the Shachal Torah, that he began Dafka and Moab because our lineage and our Geula is from Dabra Melech. I mean, this is the, the Nisham of Mashiach. And it was vital that the essence of Mashiach, he wanted to start there in Moab to show that Moab, yes, we don't marry into them, but there is this heter that Moab from there will springboard the entire Geula from Rus, who was a Moabist. And, you know, saying that, I want to just take a couple minutes because this is the last year before Tish above. And we hope that before Tish above, that Mashiach will show up, everyone will be dancing in Yerushalayim. You don't have to worry about the cost of the tickets and you don't have to worry about how to get there and pay. Everyone will be there dancing and rejoicing that the afternoon of Tisha B'Av suddenly changes. We do not find on our calendar any Yom Tif that suddenly changes in the halacha of the day. That means if we're not allowed to do something when we're davening Meir at night, that's the same halacha the next morning and Mincha time there. But the one exception is Tisha B'Av. We don't sit on seats an entire Come mincha, you could. We don't put on talis and tefillin, even though rebbes do put on talis and tefillin by shachars. But the basic halacha for all of us is that we don't wear talis and tefillin. We put on uh, talis and tefillin only by by mincha. Uh, is because there's the leda of Mashiach, and that's why in the Mishnah. Rabbeinu HaKadosh, who was Minishmas Mashiach, he was from Dovra Mela, he felt that Shabbos afternoon, that like in our year, this now, that Tishva was Shabbos, and the Chacham said, okay, it's Shabbos, but we have to push it off until Motsoi Shabbos. Rabbeinu HaKadosh protested and said, no, that once it was already Shabbos Tishva, forget about it, keep it the itcha itcha. You don't have to keep it on Tzorah Shabbos. We don't pass it like that. Chas Hashem, someone who <laughs> does something like that, he's Mamish and Avaryan, he's not allowed to do such a thing. But he held that keeping the Itcha Itcha because he felt that at the time of Mincha that there was a tremendous metamorphosis and that Mashiach who's born into every generation has a sudden bursting ruts on a will to reveal himself and to begin and to proclaim everything that happens with uh, Yemos HaMashiach and the Geula Shalema. Now, the Orachayim HaKodosh says that at the end of our first Pasuk, when it says Elad Varmasher Deeper Moshe Kol Yisrael Ba Eber Yardin Ba Midbar Ba Arava Mol Sof Bein Paran Vein the whole pasuk it says El Kol Yisrael we understand that he was standing in front and saying it to all of Kol Yisrael but the Arachayim Kodesh says an interesting thing that they are, these are timeless words. And the ethical message and the teachings of what he said now are forever. And as a matter of fact, Rav Simcha Bunim of Pshischa said when they asked him, what safer do you learn to learn Musa? You know, a person has to learn Musa. They have to improve their midos. They have to work on themselves. So they asked him, which safer do you learn? And he says, I learn every day from Sefer Devar. I use Sefer Devar. That's what he answered. And because he held, like the Arachayim HaKadosh says, that these are, El Kol Yisrael is written to tell us that we, 2,000 years later, 
or 3,300 years later from Moshe Rabbeinu that we are still able to revive and refresh ourselves and uplift ourselves by learning Sefer Devarim and letting it seep into the innermost sanctum of our hearts and the shamas, the words of Sefer Devarim, which will have a transformation effect on us, not just as reading something which doesn't become part and parcel of us, but it indeed does become a part and parcel. <clears throat> And it's, they stress that it says, not just El Yisrael, that it's timeless for us, but Kol Yisrael. Because one of the biggest problems that Kol Yisrael has is that we look down, we condescend, we are judgmental. Somebody walks into shul with a white knitted yarmulke suddenly all of us with the black hats we're looking at the person well, who knows who this is and what the person that we're judging already that this is not one of ours and it's wrong because we never know who and what the madrega of each and every yid is and how they come across and how they're loved and beloved by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So when the Navi Zechariah said, Yehofech Yomim Elu, that these days of the three weeks and all of the fast days, he said, should be transposed and turned over to become Yomim Toivim, L'moya Demu L'simcha, that, and the Hassan Sofer said that Tisha B'av will be the first day of Yom Tif, and the whole year will be Cholomoyed, and Shiva Subhatamiz will be the last day of Yom Tev. And that's how the world will be transformed, and that's what the Navi Zachariah meant to say. So says uh, the Chassam Sofer. But we have to work on ourselves that we should take away from, I mean, everyone knows the Gemara that of Tisha B'av, that uh, there, was a, uh, there was a man named Bar Kamsa that somebody hated terribly, and his friend was Kamsa. But Bar Kamsa he hated. And he made a wedding, and the guy sending out the invitation made a mistake and invited Bar Kamsa to the wedding. So when the Baal Simcha saw him there, he went up to the Morris and went over to him and said, what are you doing here? So he said, I received an invitation. I was invited. So he said, I don't want you here. I don't want to see you. I don't want you in the room. I don't. So the guy said in front of everybody, you're going to kick me out. Please don't. Then he offered him to pay half of the wedding. He, then he offered the whole wedding. He offered him to just let me stay here. Don't embarrass me and humiliate me to that. And this bar council was kicked out at the end. And he went to the czar or the king, and he motioned and spoke badly about the Yidden to get the king to take revenge on the And there, that's how the Chorm Beis English happened. That is the story in Gittin that everyone learns on Tish. So you see that the level of sensitivity, here the guy was begging him. He was willing to pay for the wedding, but this guy felt he didn't like him. I don't care what it means. I don't care if it brings down the whole world. I am not letting him stay there. So we should really work on our midos to improve our attitude to other yidden and to be able to lighten lift ourselves to the level of transforming the hate into love. A good to know.